Hey, I'm Trey Reed, happy to join the Arkansas Fly Fishers uh, at today's meeting and wish I could uh, be with y'all having some having some pig and a cold beer maybe down at Whole Hog, but uh, you know, we've got some uh, got some restrictions on on get together, so I'm happy to join you in uh, in this format today. Um, probably a good time to uh, have a little escapism and uh, this uh, the place I'm going to talk about today is is a place that I like to escape, been going down since 2007. Uh, you probably uh, know that I work at Arkansas Game and Fish Commission and I've addressed uh, Arkansas fly fishers before in that capacity, but today I'm, I'm here to talk about a, a tropical fly fishing paradise. And um, I've been traveling to this little town at the extreme uh, southern end of Mexico's Caribbean coastline since about 2007. Uh, that's when I caught my first bonefish. Um, my wife and I decided we wanted to go on a trip and uh, she wanted beach and I wanted a place to, to, to try my hand at uh, saltwater flats fly fishing. And I've always been a, a, a big fan of uh, Mexican culture, Was uh, took a lot of years of Spanish in high school and college, studied some Mexican history in college. And so I started looking in that part of the world. Um, about the same time I had been um, I'd been reading a book by Jimmy Buffett called A Salty Piece of Land. It's a, a work of fiction. He's written some, both some fiction and nonfiction. And uh, his hero, Tully Mars, it's been in a lot of his books, spent a lot of time south of uh, the town of Tulum, which is about an hour and a half south of Cancun, and lots of fly fishing adventures and what have you. And so I was like, well, that'd be cool. I want to I investigate that. So I started looking online and uh, did some internet research. And uh, I found a place that was even farther down the road. Uh, it, it's literally at the end of the road, uh, and that's my kind of place. Uh, a, a small fishing village of about 400 people, uh, about a five or six hour drive from Cancun. So uh, pulled the trigger, went on the trip, and I just fell in love with the place and been going back ever since. Uh, the name of the town is Ishkalak, and uh, X-C-A-L-A-K, that trips a lot of people up. It's uh, probably because not many of us speak Mayan, and it is a, a Mayan word. And in the Mayan language, the, the X is pronounced a couple of different ways. It's uh, when it precedes a consonant, as in this case, it's pronounced ish. And then when it uh, precedes a, a vowel, it's just sh, like the shell, uh, word shell. So this is ish. Lock and it is derived from a word uh, uh, related to the word for twins, uh, and it refers to a twin opening, two openings near town in the uh, Great uh, Mayan Reef or the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, which runs from Honduras along the Caribbean coast to Central America all the way up past uh, north of Cancun. So that's Ishkalak. Now, uh, Ishkalak takes a little bit more effort than uh, most places to get to. Uh, you're from, if you're coming from Arkansas, as, as in a lot of cases, you're going to have to catch two flights, uh, you know, out of Little Rock or XNA and then connect somewhere and get to Cancun, most likely. Uh, you're going to have to rent a car. Uh, it's about a five or six hour drive. And if you don't arrive at the airport before say about noon, uh, it's a good idea to break up the trip by stopping on the way down. And, uh, you know, it is a little bit harder to get to, but the trade-off is a chance for cultural immersion, uh, more lightly pressured fish than in some other more popular areas like Ascension Bay to the north or uh, the part of Chetumal Bay fished out of uh, Ambergris Key or San Pedro Belize to the south. Uh, and there's also, uh, it is really one, one hell of a fly fishing bargain. You, you can do this for not a lot of money, believe it or not. Um, so the question I get a lot is, where is Ishkalak? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up a little screenshot here. All right, so here, here's a map zooming in on the Caribbean. And there you have the state of Quintana Roo along the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula there, the Caribbean coast. And Ishkalak is down at the very south, the southern tip there. And that body of water that's that different, that turquoise shade of green is, is Chetumal Bay, where a lot of the fishing takes place. You got um, uh, Ascension and Espiritu Bays to the north, and then Chetumal Bay is actually, actually much larger than, than either of those. So that's, that's where Ishkalak is located. 
the fishing in the area is, is like I said, primarily in Chetumal Bay. Here's an aerial shot of Chetumal Bay. And uh, there's just all kinds of little islands, uh, just miles and miles of, of saltwater flats to explore. There's also some fishing on the Caribbean coast. Uh, you can see this is a, another aerial shot, and as I said, the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef or the Great Mayan Reef uh, sits about 500 meters off the coast, and so it protects this, this area. There's not a lot of wave action, and uh, you can fish uh, up and down the coast. I found that the, that the guides mostly go to Chetumal Bay, but under certain conditions, you'll do some fishing on the coast as well. There's also access to some lagoons, and uh, this is a shot of one of the lagoons. It's about five miles north of the Pueblo or town of Ishkalak, and uh, you can access, access these uh, stand-up paddle boards, kayaks, uh, pretty tough wading because of mud, but you can use the boat to get back into some areas and then do, you know, a little bit less wading. The species are your typical flat species, uh, bonefish, of course, probably the primary target down there. Uh, this area around Ishkalag and Chetumal Bay is probably one of the best places in the world to go to have a really good shot at a permit. Uh, if you know much about saltwater fly fishing, you know the permit is the holy grail. It's one of the most elusive species. Uh, they, they just don't like to eat. They are super finicky. You can also catch some small tarpon, uh, especially in those brackish lagoons. Uh, during late July, August, maybe into early September, they do have a migratory tarpon run where you can catch some of the, the, the big fish, you know, 100 pounds, 150 pounds. Uh, every once in a while, you might get a shot at, at a big tarpon uh, even outside of that, that migratory run. There's a, the, a few that hang out there. There's also several species of Jacks, this is a, a yellow jack, uh, but there's some jack creval, probably not to the size that you're gonna see down on the Gulf Coast, some of those 25 and 30 pound bruisers, but you can get into some good 10, 12, 15 pound jacks from time to time as well. Of course, barracuda and snook, and, and um, you, know, that, that, you, you can catch some snapper and what have you as well. Um, so how do you get there? Uh, as we all might agree, the, the journey is, is just as important as the destination. So you fly into the Cancun International Airport. Uh, I rent a car there. And then as I said, you wanna break the trip up. And uh, what I've found is a really good place to do it and a fun place to do it is the town of Tulum. There's an ancient uh, Maya ruin there uh, that's fairly well known. One of the only uh, Maya archeological sites that's on the coast. There's a famous structure called the Castillo that overlooks the coast there. But uh, Tulum is not as touristy as like say, you know, Cancun, Playa del Carmen, doesn't really have those all-inclusive resorts. It's much smaller boutique uh, hotels. Uh, it's sort of divided into the Pueblo, the town that's on the highway, and then a couple of miles uh, uh, east on the coast, you, you have, uh, the, they call it the Playa or the, or the beach zone. And, uh, but it, it's got some nightlife, it's got, uh, you know, great food. Uh, you, you can pay full-blown American prices at some of their finer restaurants, or you can do like we did here and hit a, hit a taco stand and uh, get some uh, empanadas or tacos, quesadillas, lots of, lots of great food. This is Zamas Hotel, which is uh, the hotel I've been staying at the last several years, right on the Caribbean coast. There's a lot of cool little night spots, lo lots of street art and things like that going on in Tulum. Tulum has a really kind of funky, bohemian vibe ethos going on there, and a lot, lot of artists, uh, a lot of yoga practitioners, a lot of uh, Mayan spirituality, so there's a lot of that going on there, and it's, it's, it's a really fun, neat, uh, really cool energy place. Lots of places to have a, a good cold drink, rooftop bar at a place called Mateo's there, and uh, you can even get a good uh, Italian brick oven pizza at this joint. And uh, I was going <laughs> to include this slide. Uh, if you find yourself in Tulum, uh, this is a, a distilled spirit that I didn't know existed until a couple years ago. Now, the bottle says pox, but it actually is pronounced posh or posh. And uh, it's a distillation of corn and sugar cane. And I could describe it best as Mayan moonshine. The, uh, the uh, shaman used to use it to uh, connect to the spirit world, but it works well to disconnect from the real world as well. 
And if I've got to, I've got to tout this place, if you find yourself in Tulum, this is, uh, this is a, a joint called Batey, B-A-T-E-Y, where they make the best mojitos in the world, and they're about four bucks a pop, cheaper than you can find in any uh, fine cocktail establishment in the States. And this is a guy pressing freshly sourced local sugar cane in what used to be a Volkswagen bug. And the, the cane juice uh, drips out there, and uh, they make your mojitos right there. And it's not just the classic lime and mint mojitos. They have all kinds of cool uh, flavors. My favorite is one that's made out of the local uh, Seville orange or the bitter orange, known there as Naranja Agria. And uh, so that takes the place of the lime in, in that, and they'll put a little habanero chile in it too. Um, so you, you wake up after your uh, poche and mojito hangover and uh, head to the grocery store in, in, uh, in uh, Tulum there, and it's got like regular, you know, U.S. style grocery stores, one called Chedruai that's a, that's a, a, a Mexican brand, kind of like a Sam's Club almost. You can buy tires, uh, motorcycles, and, and uh, uh, your food there as well, uh, because there's there are no grocery stores in Ishkalak. I mean, it is uh, Ishkalak only got electricity in about 2003 or four, so it's only been on the, it's been on the electrical grid less than two decades. And many of the places where the the accommodations are off grid, they're solar powered with backup generators. So uh, this is actually a shot of a market in the town of Felipe Carrillo Puerto. It's about an hour. Uh, south of Tulum, it's a good. It's kind of really the last outpost of, of civilization, and probably a town of I'm guessing 25, 30 thousand people. Um, uh, really, kind of an epicenter of Maya culture in in that part of the Yucatan Peninsula. This is a really cool market that that we always check out, and you can pick up any last minute any last minute uh, things you might have forgotten at the supermarket in Tulum. There, it's just fun to kind of, uh, you know, walk through and see all the stalls and vendors. It's, it's, it's very old school. You can even, even get some meat. I don't know that uh, I'm, uh, I'm that interested in, uh, in buying any meat from that market, but I'm sure it's fine. Th these are something that I always pick up. Uh, these, the little, the little blocks you see, the red and black blocks are a, basically a, a rub or a spice blend called Ricados. Uh, the, the red one is, a, is ubiquitous in, in Yucatecan cuisine. It's called achiote or recado rojo. And then the black one is uh, called recado negro. Uh, and it's actually made from, from deeply charred chilies and very, very popular in the cuisine down there. You're going to find that a recurring uh, theme in my presentation, uh, uh, one of the threads, I'm going to be weaving in some uh, culinary and gastronomical stuff along with the travel and fly fishing. And that's uh, just uh, something that I'm into. So I hope you are too. Now, this is Main Street in, in Ishkalak. It is, just to give you a sense of what Ishkalak is all about, uh, it's, it's a really small town. There are no paved roads. Uh, you, uh, you can't buy gas there. Uh, you might buy some gas out of an old uh, uh, two liter soda bottle. Uh, that's how it's sold there, or a, a, a cooking oil bottle. I've seen it sold that way too, but the nearest gas station is about uh, 45, 50 minutes away in Mahawal. So you top off the tank before going to Ishkalak. As I said, no paved road. Now that that's not a lewd sign that you see rusted out there. That's actually uh, a, a sign that signifies uh, what's called a tope or topes. And they're like speed tables or speed bumps and uh, they are nasty wicked. You're not gonna cruise over one at 15 miles an hour, more like two or three miles an hour. You're gonna take the front end out of your rental vehicle. Uh, Ishkalak is not for everybody. It's, uh, it, it is extremely remote. You're, you won't find any air conditioning. You um, might find a few iguanas. You, <laughs> the, as I said before, it's, it's off-grid accommodations. Uh, First time we went, it was a it was a it was a big sell for my wife because she likes hair dryers, drip coffee makers, uh, air conditioning, and, and other amenities like that. And uh, because of the solar systems and many of these accommodations, you, you can't have any of those heat generating appliances like that. 
I'm going to take you now on a, just to show you how small Ishkalak is, we're going to go on a little tour around town. So this, this is driving down Main Street here. It's probably, oh, what we would call five or six blocks. And uh, there's a tope we slowed down over and another. Um, lots of stray dogs, lots of people riding mopeds and motorcycles. Now we're going to turn back to the east. There's the Caribbean. Now we're headed back south. And uh, there's a waterfront where a lot of the commercial fishermen land their boats every day. There's just not a whole lot to it. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a really small town, but I hope that gives you com some kind of sense of, uh, we, we pretty much made the loop there, and that, that's Ishkalot. But uh, it, it is a charming place. So this is a shot. Our accommodations, once you get to Ishkalok, you've, you've still got another, uh, depending on the, the condition of the road, the beach road at the time, you've still got another few minutes, uh, anywhere from probably 10 minutes to 30 or 40 minutes to, to get to the accommodations. I've been staying the last few years at a place called a Cocote Eco Inn. It's run by an expat American named Rob Mukai, who's originally from Salt Lake City, Utah. But the beach road, the farther you get from town, the worse shape it's in. Uh, last year when I went, it, it took like less than 10 minutes to get to fishing every morning to where we meet the guides in town. It has taken me as long as 30, 40 minutes before because uh, when it rains during the wet season, you get a lot of washout. The roads are basically just compacted limestone pebble, uh, uh, really making the roads the same way the Maya made them for centuries and centuries. But uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting journey and, and, a, and a fun uh, drive through the jungle. And it kind of gives you that time, a, a daily commute, if you will, to get your head together before fishing every day. This is a Cocote Eco Inn. Uh, it's uh, a really small, you might call it a boutique hotel. It's basically four apartments. Uh, the owner, Rob, lives in one of them, so he rents out as many as three, two upstairs units, two downstairs, literally steps from the Caribbean. A Cocote was one of the, one of the first um, hotels built down there in the, in the 90s, or I say hotels, properties built by, you know, Americans coming in trying to establish a, 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 an ecotourism industry. Very small, but I mean, it's great for three or four fishermen per, per unit. You, you've got a main room there, uh, two bedrooms. One has a queen bed, one has uh, two uh, full beds. Um, there, you can, if there's a futon you can make out for, for a fourth guy. You know, you're not there very much, maybe cooking a few meals, sleeping at night, um, having some, uh, some drinks after a day of fishing. Uh, that's the walkway to the Palapa. A Palapa is kind of like a, a, a Mexican or Central American pole barn, a thatched roof uh, structure with open sides. This one is screened in. There's your view from, from the uh, sliding glass door at the, at the back of your accommodations. Not, not too shabby. Rob really caters to uh, traveling fly fishermen. He's got like a, a rod washing station, uh, rod racks in the, in the rooms. Uh, He's, he's actually what he calls the second, has what he calls the second largest fly shop in Mexico, the Fish Galak Fly Shop, which is essentially a cabinet in the Palapa, but you can pick up some leaders, and Rob does a lot of tying and developed a few patterns himself. But one thing that I really like that he does, uh, whenever a new guest arrives, whether that's you or somebody else is, is checking in during your stay, he has what he calls Roboritas in the Palapa, and this is Rob's take on a, a margarita. Rob actually used to be in the liquor business. He was the marketing uh, director for High West Distillery in Utah. Uh, when he left that, it's when he uh, went to Ishkalak to start a Cocote. So he, he's pretty good around the bar. Uh, he says uh, the, the recommended dose is two, and anything beyond that he does not take responsibility for. But it, it's really a cool way to meet some other guests, talk fishing, and everybody gets to, to know one another. A, a really cool thing that Rob does. Since 2007, I've been fishing with uh, Osprey Tours. Uh, local captain Victor Castro uh, has a landing there in town. There's Victor and some of his crew with uh, some of my crew from uh, last year's trip. Right there in the shadow of the lighthouse is where Victor keeps his boats. 
I should say where Victor kept his boats. I'm going to, uh, unfortunately, Victor uh, passed away this year. He was only 57 years old and succumbed to uh, COVID-19. And uh, he lost his mom, his dad, and his own life in a span of about three or four weeks. And it was, uh, it was, uh, he, he was more than a guy, he was a dear friend. And uh, kind of get a little bit choked up talking about it, but uh, uh, clear that air uh, before we go any further. He, he was a, a, a very, very good friend. No matter where you go, it's always a great boat ride out to the flats. Um, one of the things, uh, you, uh, you basically run about two miles south of town and cut through what's called the Zaragoza Canal to get into Chetamal Bay. It's a man-made canal. And uh, this is actually an old portion of the Zaragoza Canal that was built around the, the turn of the 20th century. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a map here in a minute that, that, that kind of shows the layout. And there's an actual, a newer part of the canal that was built and I believe opened in 2002 or, or 2003. But it is just absolutely stunning to uh, to, to take a boat ride out to the flats every morning. Here's a, here's a screenshot from Google, and you can see at the north there is, is Ishkalak. Uh, there's a, the, a big lagoon called Town Lagoon uh, right there, but you're, you, you basically, you're gonna run down south every morning. This is the, main, the new Zaragoza Canal here. Uh, that's, the, that's the area, the, the cut that takes you into Chetamal Bay. And you can see the, the international boundary right there. If you've ever, if you're familiar with San Pedro Belize or Ambergris Key, that's it. I mean, uh, the, the canal, there's one small piece of Mexico south of the canal uh, before you get to a natural waterway called the Bacalar Chico that is the border between Mexico and Belize right there. You know, there's no border crossings or anything like that. It's all mangroves and, and, and Chetamal Bay. But you're going to fish in, in all those areas, all that light colored water there on the, on the uh, west side of, of the cut. Uh, just, just countless little lagoons to explore. And this, these, are, this is, these are all called keys. This is Cayo Chilem. I think this is called Cayo Dos de Abril, 2nd of April. But there's all these just air, just miles and miles of flats to wade here. It is just, it's, it's, it's truly an amazing place. There are some do-it-yourself opportunities, and I'm going to talk about those in a little bit. But you really learn so much from guides, just like anywhere you go. Uh, their boats afford you miles and miles of access and quick access to places that would be very hard to wade to or would take you hours and hours to get to. Uh, and again, their knowledge. If you've ever uh, done, if you've never done any saltwater fly fishing, you, it, it, it's really like still hunting. You, you spend a lot of time uh, in, in the bow of the boat just cruising as the guide pulls you around the flats and you're just looking and scanning the water, looking through the water and, you know, just looking for flashes or, or nervous water on the surface, uh, just any sign of fish. And uh, so it's not like a lot, you're casting a lot. I mean, you, you, some days you might not make 10 or 12 casts all day, uh, but, but there's a lot of looking. And as I've already mentioned, and you can tell the scenery is not too bad. And when you do find a, uh, uh, a bonefish or a permit and get a chance to cast to it. Uh, all those long hours of, uh, of patiently or impatiently waiting are sometimes rewarded with an incredible fight. Another technique you'll use sometimes is to, is to get out and wade. Uh, on, on this day that this photo was taken, it was incredibly windy. Our first day there in, uh, on a 2019 trip in April and the wind was just howling. It was just impossible to cast. It always blows there. It, it, casting is always difficult, but uh, it, was, it was really windy on this day. And so Felipe Miravete, uh, Victor's nephew, uh, took Lee Redmond and I into some of these sort of backcountry lagoons, and you do a little bit of wading around there. But just because they're small lagoons doesn't mean that there are small bonefish. But you can catch some really nice fish in these lagoons. These were both about 18 inch bonefish and put up one heck of a fight. 
Take some good weighting uh, shoes. They don't have to be the lace-up kind, but they do need a pretty solid bottom to keep from cutting yourself on coral and limestone. If, you, uh, if you're waiting, one thing the guides will tell you, I'm only half joking, is to uh, watch out for the cocodrilos. That's a saltwater crocodile. Uh, we saw this slide and, and footprints. <laughs> this was about an hour of fishing and uh, wondered why he didn't tell us about that sooner. But uh, pretty, pretty fre fresh tracks there. They're, they're not giants like the Australian saltwater crocs you, you see on uh, Crocodile Hunter. But, but uh, there's still something to think about, keeping the back of your mind when you're out there wading. On foot, your casts don't have to be as long because obviously when you're not standing in the bow of, of a boat, your, your, your profile is lower, but you're, you're probably making 35, 40 foot casts uh, on, when you're wading. Uh, in the boat, sometimes, you know, 40 to 60 feet, uh, sometimes maybe even a little bit longer than that. Um, um, this lagoon here is sort of, uh, is really cool because, uh, you know, bonefish make blistering runs. The bonefish had made one run and, and uh, uh, Lee was pretty sure that he had him whipped here. This, this lagoon is sort of uh, like an hourglass shape and we're standing in the narrow sort of uh, necked down part of it, if, if you will. And the bonefish is, you can see him pretty clearly right there coming in. And as uh, Felipe goes in to try to make the <laughs> snag, the bonefish was not done yet. He had only made one run, and they always make two, usually three, and he just takes off, stirring up water everywhere. They are so powerful. So finally, after, uh, after that second unexpected run, Felipe, who, who saw me shooting my iPhone video and, and uh, graciously took my rod so I could use both hands, lands a pretty nice bonefish, a.k.a. Macabi in Spanish. You come in from a long day of fishing and having those bonefish uh, bust your arms up like that and uh, uh, obviously you work up an appetite and as I promised uh, there is a, a culinary and gastronomical thread running through this presentation as well. Um, despite its small size there are a handful of restaurants in town. I usually cook meals about half the time and then go out and pick up uh, dinner, support the local economy. Uh, there's not much there except uh, commercial fishing and, and tourism in, in the form of fly fishing and bird watching and other ecotourism, diving and snorkeling, that sort of thing. Uh, this is uh, through the window of Toby's Restaurant where you can find the locals hanging out and get a little local flavor from time to time. Uh, Toby's has a taco night on Wednesday nights and you know, we, we were, this was actually a Thursday night and we were, we were the only visitors in the restaurant and I highly recommend the, uh, the fried fish fingers made with fresh mutton snapper, pretty incredible, or mangrove snapper sometimes. Now this little yellow nondescript home is actually another restaurant. It has a, a name I'm told, but nobody calls it by that name. They call it the Carnitas Place. Um, there are a few tables set up under the, under the home there. And then there's like a, a palapa out back where they cook uh, carnitas every morning. They build a wood fire and have this huge cast iron pot and, and cook pork, seasoned pork in it. And it is just absolutely phenomenal. I think a kilo or 2.2 pounds of, of pork costs like less than 10 bucks. It, it, it's just amazing. When you've got prices like that, it, it just doesn't pay to cook your own meals back at the hotel. But the culinary star of Ishkalak is the Leaky Palapa restaurant. Um, Leaky Palapa is, uh, uh, the, uh, is owned by uh, a couple of ladies from Canada, Linda Liu and Marla Stiles. And uh, Rob Mukai, who, who, um, who owns a Coco Tay, has lived and traveled all over the world. And he says, I've been in some of the foodiest cities, lived and traveled to some of the foodiest cities, and they're in my global top 10 anywhere. And that includes places like Tokyo, Sydney, 
uh, LA, uh, elsewhere. Uh, it is truly phenomenal food. And you know, you're gonna pay more than you will for the fish fingers at Toby's, but the prices are really incredible for the quality of the food. Okay, short, short little sidebar here. Um, I'm, I'm burying the lead a little bit, but uh, a little bit of news to share with you too. I've actually uh, recently taken on a, a part-time role. I'm not leaving my day job at Game and Fish. I'm going to be the managing editor of Tail Fly Fishing Magazine. And I bring that up here because uh, I've been reading Tail for a little while and uh, I pitched an article to them about the leaky palapa because I eat there every time I go. And uh, they liked it and they said, well, how about writing about the fly fishing too? And I, I did that in the July, August issue and here just uh, a few months later, uh, the, the managing editor stepped down to pursue other interests and they asked me if I'd like to step in. And so uh, uh, I owe a little bit to the leaky palapa and uh, we'll see how a, a guy from landlocked Arkansas does editing a saltwater fly fishing magazine. Anyway, Linda Liu on the left there and Marla Stiles, uh, her wife on the right, uh, were diving and traveling through Central America and Mexico back in the early 2000s. They had their own uh, portable air compressor and uh, somebody approached a Manishka lock and said, I've got this vacant property here, y'all ought to open a, a, a restaurant. And uh, Marla is, is a, a classically trained chef and uh, Linda had also worked in the, in the restaurant business and so we're sort of on a, a wild hair, they left the Great White North in Canada, uh, sold their house, sold their restaurant and uh, opened up a restaurant in a town of 350 or 400 people at the end of the road in the Mexican Caribbean. The results have been phenomenal. Uh, in 2013, they, they moved from the original location, which was a palapa that leaked, which is how the restaurant got its name, uh, into a new home and the bottom floor was designed as a restaurant with a, a kitchen. The food is just amazing. Uh, Great appetizer, or the uh, uh, fried ravioli. Uh, fresh fish is always on the menu here. It is probably about two or three good casts from, from the restaurant to, to the Caribbean. So there's a good chance whatever's on your plate at night was swimming earlier in the day. And uh, Linda runs the front of house operations and is uh, a good hand with the cocktails. I highly recommend her specialty, which is a a chile lime, uh, I'm sorry, a chile pineapple margarita to die for. So back to the fishing. I mentioned that guided trips are a great way to get local knowledge, support the local economy, get to a lot more places, but there are some great do-it-yourself opportunities. Uh, we took one afternoon after being guided and, and, and hit one of the spots um, west of town. Uh, Ishkalak is, is on a peninsula that juts south to, toward uh, Ambergris Cay. And uh, so there's a couple of really primitive roads, but roads nonetheless uh, leading east out of town, I'm sorry, west out of town, uh, to, that take you to a defunct ferry terminal. Um, a ferry terminal was built, but after building it uh, in typical uh, sort of developing world boondoggle fashion, uh, the the, uh, they discovered after building the terminal that the ferry was much, the, the water was much too shallow in Chetumal Bay to get a ferry loaded with cars from Ishkalak over to the state capital of Chetumal, which uh, sits on the other side of the bay. Uh, but there's a road and a fly fisherman can benefit from that by driving over, parking their car, and just walking in and, and wading again miles and miles of flats. Again, basically you just park your car, uh, put your wading boots on, get your gear ready, and then just strike out pretty much in any direction. When we were down there, uh, uh, as the pandemic began uh, in March of last year, uh, we met some new friends, uh, Katie Winger here and her partner, Bob Haynes, down from Durango, Colorado. Bob's a really good fly fisherman. He's a manager at Spirit Lake, I think is the name of it, outside of Durango, Colorado and uh, Katie caught this really good bonefish uh, just on, on the beach, walking down the beach, just north of a Cocote. Uh, you can also, that tarpon picture I showed earlier was, the, the, was also Katie, and she caught that in the lagoon uh, west of a Cocote on the west side of the beach road. And Bob, Bob really showed out and caught a really nice permit in the uh, on the beach anyway the water is just incredibly beautiful and you get these just varying shades of 
from clear to blue to, to, to green, great overhead shot of a tight loop there uh, on, the, on the coast side as well. So not only can you walk up and down the beach, but the guides do fish the, the coast side every once in a while. We saw a few permit on the coast uh, last trip, but just uh, couldn't make any of them eat. This is, a, I, I talked about the, just the color of the water and everything there, and this is one that just, it is just incredible. The different shades of blue that you that you get on the water there, uh, it's uh, it, there's never there's never a dull boat ride uh, when fishing around Ishkalak, Mexico. That's for sure. As I mentioned before, Ishkalak and this part of Mexico is probably one of the best places you can go anywhere in the world outside of some even more remote places, maybe the Seychelles and things like that. Uh, that to, to catch permit. Uh, it doesn't get the pressure that Ascension Bay, there's a lot of lodges up at, uh, at Punta Allen, uh, which is down a, a dead end road from Tulum, about 25, 30 miles south of the, the beach zone in Tulum. That's where the famous Palometa Club is. Um, and Ascension is much smaller and, and gets probably a lot more visitors because it's, it's closer to Cancun. You know, it's, in, it's basically two hours from Cancun as opposed to five and a half or six. So now the thing you got to know about permit fishing though is that it's, a, it's an all-in proposition. Uh, now sure, you can go out and chase bonefish and you'll come across permit from time to time. Um, I actually caught my first permit um, last year uh, in such a scenario. But most of the time you're telling the guy in the morning we want to chase permit. And, uh, uh, if you're familiar with the great uh, writer Thomas McGuane, uh, he wrote a, a, a story years ago called The Longest Silence. Actually, there's a book, The Longest Silence, with a collection of short stories. But The Longest Silence, the story itself, is about permit fishing. And The Longest Silence is about permit fishing because there are long, long periods of inactivity uh, where there's, you're just looking and looking and looking and there's nothing there and you start to give up hope and then all of a sudden they're, they're there when they weren't before. And uh, so these long silences are punctuated by moments of just extreme exhilaration when you finally do see a fish, most often followed by the pangs of dejection and frustration when it doesn't eat your fly. After about... Uh, Two and a half weeks over three trips down there uh, between 2018 and 2020, I finally hooked up with a permit. And uh, I think the posture there pretty much explains the way I was feeling about it. He was by no means a giant, but as the saying goes, a permit is a permit. And uh, that's number one for me on the fly. And I, I hope to uh, keep counting as, as the years go on. It was an incredible moment, uh, made even uh, more special by, by, by being in the boat with, with uh, Captain Victor that day. Uh, he wasn't supposed to guide me that day, he, uh, but they had a scheduling snafu, so he texted me the night before and said, hey, I'm going to take you out tomorrow. Or he asked, so can I take you out tomorrow, uh, you and one other from your group? And uh, he guided me to my first bonefish in 07 and uh, my first permit last year. This is a permit from 2019, a trip in, in April, when uh, Lee Redmond hooked into that about 12 pound permit with, um, with Felipe. It was, it was a pretty incredible experience just being in the boat for that, even though I, it was a vicarious thrill for me. We'll, we'll go show you a few more shots because this is not something that happens every day. And I've got a little video here. This fight lasted about, oh, probably 15 to 20 minutes at least, uh, using 20 pound um, uh, tippet or, 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 or 20 pound leaders actually. We weren't using uh, actual tippet in this instance. To answer the question about, about flies and, and gear, typically we're using um, eight or, or nine weight rods. Uh, we've carried some 10 weights in the past to, to fool with the tarpon. Um, I, I caught my permit on a, a nine weight sage launch 
uh, on um, a uh, uh, EP crab. Uh, Lee caught the permit you just saw on an EP crab. I think he was using, I'm not sure if he was using eight weight or nine weight sage that time. The other important consideration, you've got to have a good, uh, a reel, a good reel with a good drag system. It's not like, you know, even a big brown around here. I mean, you're, they're getting into your backing, uh, almost guaranteed. Even some of those 12 inch bonefish are, are, are gonna get into your backing. And when you hook into a 10, 12 pound permit, uh, uh, it's, it, it's gonna take a while and you need, you need good equipment. Here's another shot of, of some of the flies. And I'll, I'll zoom in to a little bit closer shot because this one, um, there's two flies here that are that, that basically produce two permit in in the last three trips I've made. This is the EP crab. These were tied by Lee Redman, and and he caught his permit on 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 this one here, and uh, mine was just a little bit darker shade of that. But but the guides every time when you at the end of the trip you'll you'll typically in addition to tipping the guides daily you'll hey, you want to pick some of my flies out because they can't get tying materials. There's no fly shops other than Rob's small place. And uh, so they always pick these light colored EP crabs, always the first ones to go when, when they pick through your boxes. That tells me that's, that's, that's the money fly. We've tried some of those flexo crabs, uh, taking them, but the guides just never, never seem to want to, want to use them. Uh, the other popular fly for, for permit, and, it, and it's a good fly because it can double for bonefish, is something like the uh, Viverkus manis shrimp. Um, those seem to be really popular as well, or, or patterns like that. There, here's a shot um, I did for Tail Fly Fishing Magazine. They ended up not using it. They, uh, I guess my photo skills weren't, weren't what they wanted them to be on this uh, fly shot, but I'll run through this because this kind of covers the, the bases on the different species down there. So these are the two colors that have produced permit in the last last couple of years. From, from left there, that lighter tan EP, and then the little bit darker tan is what I caught mine on. Uh, so that middle fly is, uh, is uh, the third from left, was designed by a Swedish angler who spend, goes to a Cocote for about six weeks every year. His name is UC Sch I don't speak Swedish, so, but, but UC, J-U-S-S-I, uh, developed that fly. It's kind of like a Viverkus shrimp, uh, kind of the same style. Uh, he calls it a red-striped kuken, which is a Swedish word that uh, I probably can't repeat. And ladies, if you speak Swedish, I apologize uh, because it's, uh, it's, 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 kind of a, um, it's kind of a naughty name. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he uses like a red sharpie to, 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 to put stripes on it. That's where the red stripe name comes from, and it also has legs. Now, the fourth fly from left is a Christmas Island special, but I, I put it in here just to kind of represent. You fish with a lot of gotchas and, and crazy charlies for bonefish. You can see that that fly is pretty sparse, and the guides and the fish do seem to prefer a, a, a sparsely uh, tied pattern with not, not a lot of wing there. Now the final fly on the far right uh, is a cockroach, and that exact fly was used by Casey Hughes from here in Arkansas, who I believe was a speaker not too long ago for, for Arkansas fly fishers. Casey, of course, is a guide out of Ozark Angler, but Casey used that fly to hook uh, about a 100-pound tarpon in, uh, in uh, March of 2020. Uh, I said hook because uh, he jumped it three times, and uh, third time was the charm for that, for that big tarpon, AKA uh, Sabalo in Spanish. Uh, I called that section of the article entailed the Sabalo Sorrow for Casey. As I said before, Ishkalak's not for everybody. I mean, uh, there's, you know, it's, it's a little roughing it, don't get me wrong. It's, it's comfortable at night. Uh, the sea breezes are nice, but that, the, the, the less pressure on the fish, uh, I love travel, I love cultural immersion, and most importantly, I can afford it. Uh, you know, with airfare uh, from, from Little Rock, all the accommodations, all the guides, uh, 
some of our meals, we do it for less than $2,500 a person when I do uh, four man groups um, every year. So it, it's, it's I, I happened to look it up before doing the presentation. The, the Palometta Club uh, in, in Punta Allen is, is $4,000 for six nights lodging, five days fishing. We used to do six nights lodging, five days fishing with airfare for 2500 so i mean it's not the, the palometta club i mean and and uh, there's certainly a well-known name and there's great fishing up in ascension bay but it is really an incredibly affordable uh travel fly fishing uh, adventure for a, 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 i can almost guarantee you're going to catch bonefish and can promise you you'll have shots at permit and maybe get lucky enough to get one to eat that's all I've got. I, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation, uh, some, some imagery of some beautiful places. I hope I did it justice. If you want to read more about it, I uh, urge you to subscribe to Tail Fly Fishing Magazine. Just Google it. You'll, you'll find it. Uh, you can tell folks you know the managing editor, and uh, you got a firsthand uh, uh, view of, of the trip that was described in the July-August issue of 2020. See you all next time.